Um, the title of this evening's talk, I'm changing in order to get an insight into the very nature of the talk. It's going to be um, the art of meditation. Because if you're going to explore meditation, you might want to get the most perfect example. And therefore, you want to get the most perfect form in which to express it. And therefore, we can do tonight's lecture in terms of that. Now, to play tonight, all we need is three things. We need this quote from the time is, this model, and then we'll play with analogies and we'll do our thing on top of it. Now, the Demiurgos is a name for God. God the maker, a doer. Ergos work, he's a working God. So the Demiurgos is to the model as the model is to the universe. Now, let's put that aside. All creative processes Right. Follow essentially this model. Here is a very talented artist, as you can see from my figure. He must have a model, external or internal. He must then be able to focus on that model. <coughs> and then there's a skill he must possess that guides his hand in the construction of the work. The degree to which the work matches the model, to that degree we can say the work is therefore successful. We can even judge it as to the degree to which it can be said to be matching. We can say to that degree the work is true. That is to say, there is a measure of truth, if we mean by truth, the correspondence between the model and the copy, for this is a copy. This is our copy. So let me just put it that way for a moment. This is our copy, and therefore, if this is the basic concept of all creative processes, then the artist or the maker must then have a model in his mind, and on that basis, he must then, I'm using he just out of preference of tradition. Um, the artist, therefore, then fixing his mind on the model allows then the process of creation to produce the copy. And therefore, this is really God, the Demiurgos. And he has an idea in his mind, or it is the mind of God, and it's on that reflection that the copy, which is the universe, is therefore brought into existence. Now, you can see ahead now, you can quite clearly see why we're going to be talking about the art of meditation, for this is a meditation model. That is to say, you have to have an ideal, a model, even if it's a negative uh, model, you must nonetheless have something in your mind about what you're striving for. And to the degree to which you can match it, to that degree of meditation is true. Now, if we want to therefore generate our concern, what we're really interested in seeing whether we can grasp a theology, that's what we want. We want to grasp a theology based upon a cosmology. Well, this is a cosmology, you see. God, therefore, focuses on the, on the model. What's the model? The model is himself, because he makes the universe on the image, and the, the image that he has in his mind, therefore, is going to be himself. Therefore, he's reflecting upon himself. In that reflection, that becomes the model. On that basis, he then creates. 
To the degree that he judges the creation as good, to that degree it is a true. That is to say, we can say the creation is truth. It's a model of truth. Now, how do we go from a cosmology, which is a creating the universe, to a theology? Well, let's hold that for a moment and go back here. Suppose we could ask this artist a series of questions about, see, what we want to know is, what's the process of creation? What's the process of creation? Is it possible that we can understand that relationship, the process? Because if we understand that process, then we'll be able to understand any creative process. But if we understand that process, that will tell us something about the creator. Because at that moment, the creator is functioning as an artist. All other characteristics and attributes we're leaving behind. Uh, whether he wears glasses, whether he's holy, whether he's not holy. It's only in his creative aspect of his creation that we really are concerned. Therefore, what we want to know here in the creation of the universe according to the Platonic model, what we want to see is what we can learn, what we can learn about God in this process. Now, What is this now? Look here, here we have it. Now let's see if we can get it even clearer. We can say God is to his cosmos, because rather than use the word universe, cosmos means that there's an intelligible process going on. Universe doesn't necessarily mean that, it just means one verse. But cosmos contains in the idea, right, a cosmos, a, an intelligent creation, an intelligent universe. Therefore, God is to his cosmos as a model is to its copy. Now we have a four terminology. God is to his cosmos as a model is to his copy. Therefore, God produces a copy. The model is the cosmos. Now, what do we want to see? We want to see again how we can understand this process between the two. What can we learn from Plato's Timaeus, Platonic vision of the cosmos, that will help us understand what God goes through in the creative process of generating the cosmos? If we can line those things up carefully, we should be able to know something about what he does in the creation. Wait a minute, if we can collect all the things that he does in the process of creation, we'll get an insight into theology. That is, the study of the deos, right? The, the study of the theos, the study of the God. In the very act of creating, it should tell us something about it. Well, let's see. Now look here. If we're going to do that. What do we do? We need to know something about analogy, don't we? Because this is an analogy. So, and this is one of the most interesting of quotes from the time is that's going to guide us for this evening. Right? The most beautiful of bonds is that which most perfectly unites into one both itself and the things which it binds together. And to effect this in the most beautiful manner is the natural property of analogy. That's the key. Now, when we're reading Platonic literature, while you can look at this in a variety of ways, the best way is to recognize that there's a great precision in the language. Right? That's what we want. There's a great precision in the language. It's not meant for an effect. It's very, very precise. So we have to match what he's doing with our own understanding to see that behind this language there's a great deal of very careful thought brought together succinctly expressed with great economy, and yet there's an artistic side to it because this itself is a creative process, and therefore Plato's Timaeus is a creative process coming out of the mind of Plato, and therefore this is a cosmology for which we can then get an insight into the mind of Plato. Same reasoning. So what is it we want to focus on? Well, first we want to know why this is here. Why call it beautiful? In what way bonds? 
Uh, it must not just unite, but why perfectly. Right? And it binds it together most perfectly whew, into a one. You must see this oneness in it. And what must it do? Both itself and the things to which it relates. Therefore, it, the, whatever the binding is must also bind itself. And the only thing that will do this, the thing that most effectively does this, in the most, again, beautiful manner, is the natural property of analogy. All right, now we're going to go back to this. All right, this is an IOU. We have to see if we can make sense of this. Now, uh, let me see then if we can do this. I think we can do the whole thing by just reading though we could go through the whole time is and see how it operates on many levels, we can take a look at one page and find the basic characters and characteristics of the nature of God in the process of creation in one. I think it's just one page. That's all we need. Ah, good. Uh, how about reading for us? Would you? Thank you very much. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. Um, I think it's 29C. Yeah, all right. Um, what page are you on? That's a good page. Uh, but turn the page to 55, please. Okay, that's a 29E. Okay, now, what we're going to do, all we're going to do is as he reads, we're going to pick up the description of the demiurgos as he goes through the process of creation. We're going to collect those terms, we're going to pull them together, and then we're going to go back into analogy and pull it together. That's where we're going, and then make a general statement about some interesting things. All right, how about it? Time is starts. Let us now state the cause wherefore he that constructed is constructed becoming and the all. See, this is the supreme principle of all creation. God. He was good, and in him that is good no envy arises, ariseth ever concerning anything. And being devoid of envy, he desired that all should be so far as possible like unto himself. See, what does he have? Desire. Right. He's good, no envy with him. He has the property of desire. What is it that he desires? That all should be like himself. That's the model. Therefore, he reflects upon himself as the model for creation. Go ahead. This principle, then, we shall be wholly right in accepting from men of wisdom as being above all the supreme orig originating principle of becoming and the cosmos. Okay. You see, when he does this, therefore, it's the pr supreme, uh, supreme principle of creation, of creation as becoming. And he adds something to that, and the all. And that's what we want to look at, because something else comes into creation as a result of this. And in typical Platonic manner, this is obvious, this is the great gift. So, right, with two levels. What are we going to do? We're going to look at the process of becoming, and we're going to get something better. And he always adds something. When he adds something, keep your mind on that and collect those together. All right, go ahead ahead. For God desired that, so far as possible, all things should be good and nothing evil. Wherefore, when he took over all that was visible, seeing that it was not in a state of rest, but in a state of discordant and disorderly motion, he brought it into order out took of Took over? Disorder. 
See, took over disorder, brought order. Now we want to see how he does that. Deeming that the former state is in all ways better than the latter. Right, right. Deems. Now what's he doing? Right here he's desiring deeming. Deeming is, is considering judging. For him who is most good, it neither was nor is impermissible to perform any action save what is most fair. Uh, this translator always is reluctant to use the word beautiful in, in very key places, so he uses the word fair, but it's kalos, right? So it's, it's most, most beautiful. Okay, go ahead. As he reflected, therefore, he perceived that of such creatures as are by nature visible, <coughs> none that is irrational will be fairer, comparing holes with holes, than the rational. Look, see. He is desires something, takes something over, he judges it, makes a value judgment, this is better than that. All right, what is he interested in in bringing about something that is beautiful? Because if he is good, there's nothing, every one of his acts is going to be beautiful. And we want to see the connection between these two in a short while. All right, he reflects, he compares, this is, the, this is what he's going through in the process of creation. Go ahead. And further, that reason cannot possibly belong to any apart from soul. So, look here. He sees the necessary connection between reason and soul. And since that is, right, that's necessary, it's fundamental. This is a fundamental principle. That is to say, you can't have intelligence floating around. In, independent of something which possesses it, that soul. So he says, ah, given that, we're now going to do something very creative. So because of this reflection, he Say, because of this reflection, I'll, I'll shut up, go ahead. Because of this reflection. <laughs> he constructed reason within soul and soul within body as he fashioned the all. Right. Hey, to get the all then, we have reason, body, Soul and soul is that which brings it all together. Go ahead. That so the work he was executing might be of its nature most beautiful and most good. Right, it has to be most beautiful and good. Since there's no envy in him, he doesn't mind creating anything like himself. He's not jealous of his creation. Ah. Thus then, in accordance with the likely account, we must declare that this cosmos has verily come into existence as a living creature endowed with soul and reason owing to the providence of God. This whole thing. Now, this is a very key word, of course, providence. Right, and we'll, we'll return to it in a minute. Go ahead. This being established, we must declare that which comes next in order, in the semblance of which of the living creatures did the constructor of the cosmos construct it? Now, this is step one. Now he's going to go into step two, which is now finding a model for living creatures. This was for the total. And that's all we're doing. All right, now we can go further into this and take a look at the cosmology. We can see how the heavens are created how the heavens are created and the planetary system relates to the Greek diatonic scale. We can see how the mean analogies function, but essentially I'd like to stay here for a while. So that's where we're gonna stop for a moment. All right, okay. Now, we have to, we have to make sure of something, and that is that we would like to see how we can express this creative process. Now, what we're now getting here are the, the processes that go on in the very fundamental basis of the cosmology. One, no hesitancy in creating. Now once we have that, Notice then, creation presupposes a desire. Therefore, 
in, in this divinity, the creator, there must be a desire. It must be a desire that all should be like himself. Therefore, likeness is going to be the principle, the supreme principle of creation. That in order for something to be created in the universe, the first creation, in order for creation to take place, therefore, the condition for creation must be there first, right? The condition must precede the effect, right? The condition, the necessary condition for creation, therefore, is that there must be the, the possibility for creating a likeness. That's the fundamental thing. That's the supreme principle of all creation, likeness. Right? So therefore he desires that all should be like himself. What does that mean? That means that which has reason, body and soul, to that degree is like himself. Now, that's a very interesting thing because in a few minutes we want to talk about how he makes soul. Reason, that's easy to see. And they'll be together in a minute. All right. So. Well, I'm not sure of that, but what would you say these qualities are in the creation? Come on. In the creation? Yeah, what's he doing? Judging. Judging. Judging things as necessarily being beautiful. He's reflecting, comparing. What, what, what would you call this? Uh, it's qualities of soul. Um, of soul with or without reason. With reason. Ah. So therefore, the fundamental principle behind all creation is that this likeness must exist, but that's only possible if therefore there is an intelligible principle in the nature of God, right? And therefore, God must be intelligible. Right? The very basis of intelligibility must be reside in God. Ah, now look here. What kind of reasoning? See, he looks over all the disorder, and what's he going to do? He's going to bring it to order. He's not creating out of nothing. He's bringing it to order. By the way, those people involved in meditation, what's the first thing they encounter in their own meditation when they begin? It's all disordered. It is all disordered. And they're going to have to then bring in some order. The first step of meditation is right here then, isn't it? Now, the only reason you want to do that the only reason you want to do it is that you really like to bring order so that it can be good. You want to be better. The only reason why you're going to go through such strange activity. So what do you have to do? You have to take over the disorder. You have to take it over. Well, if you don't have any idea of what you're doing, it's likely that you're not going to succeed. Therefore, if creation is a model for meditation, we can use this then and apply it to ourselves, can we not? And that will make us more intelligible and good, will it not? Sure. Yes, so look, see? Now, how did you bring order? How do you bring it order? <coughs> In this case, you see, the, the whole process of meditation then is reflecting back upon oneself, this capacity to reflect back upon oneself and to find some supreme principle of creation within ourselves is the very goal of any kind of meditation. That is, any kind of meditation that has a rational principle behind it. Now, this activity, the activity, the, the possibility of turning upon oneself and reflecting upon oneself, that's the great idea in Greek philosophy, which sometimes is translated as the word essence. That's what the word really means, essence. It should never be used in any other way. Right? That's what essence is. Now, since we have that capacity to turn upon ourselves, what we want to do when we turn upon ourselves is not just to reflect on a small part of ourselves, but to accept ourselves in a totality. Now, would you not agree there's no physical thing that can turn upon itself at all points? It might be a euboreous figure like that, very interesting snake that is able to bite its own tail. All right? But then that's not turning upon itself in its entirety, only grasping its tail. Therefore, this, is, this essence-like movement is only possible for something intelligible. 
if it is possible to grasp the nature of the self in its entirety, if it's possible to grasp the nature of the self in its entirety, then obviously then this possibility then is significant because this possibility then of turning upon oneself and grasping the nature of oneself in its totality is the very thing that God's doing in his own creation. He's able to grasp himself in its totality and grasping that in its totality, he's able to use that as a model in the creation. Yeah, wouldn't it be strange if he was only grasped part of it? Then creation would be only a part. This is what's called, of course, in Greek thought, azousia, anglicizing. Right? Pardon me? That's equitable with meditation, it's the same thing? Equitable in meditation. Equitable. With meditation. Hmm? Equitable with meditation. No, no, that's the process of meditation. Who see it? Who see it? Yeah. Who see it is, is that property in man and in creation and anything intelligible that can turn upon itself and grasp itself in its entirety as a whole, simultaneous whole must be simultaneous whole, not as parts, not collectively, not in sequence, but unitarily. Right? Seeing that in a moment, simultaneously, in the moment, is the whole process of grasping the essence of oneself from the Greek, right? That's, that's the basic idea. Now, sometimes they translate this word as being, but that shouldn't be, because being means something else. All right, now look now, look here now. What does it mean? You see, this is a constant activity. It's a constant activity because the creative process is a constant activity. Therefore, in the creation of the universe, it's an ongoing process. Therefore, God is continuously absorbed in, in reflecting upon himself, and in the very act of absorb, absorption in himself is the creation. Now, wait, that's very interesting. Um, how can that be said? Well. Let's try it now. Um, maybe I can use this little piece here. Um, in the time is there are two terms, same <clears throat> and other. When they use the word same, right, that which is eternally the same and has no variation and is a whole without parts, <clears throat> that is the same thing as he's calling the model. That's the idea in the mind of God. Right? That's the idea in the mind of God. That's that object God reflects upon in order to create the universe. That model, capital I by the way, not, right? that, that model is called the property of the same. The chaos, the disorder, that's the other. It's that which is ceaselessly changing and turning about and going through its multifarious forms. Therefore, these are the two principles in the universe, same and other. Therefore, in trying to fashion soul, these are the only two things in the universe. Therefore, God took the same and other, took the same and other, and mix them, and therefore created out of that mixture a new third thing. One, two, three. One, two, three. This then, one, two, three, he mixes together, he mixes these together in a certain ratio analogical ratios. He mixes these together using being itself to mix them. That soul, that soul, see, that soul, that becomes soul. Now, ha, huh, if that's soul, then a part of man, by necessity, must be intelligible and must be part of the mind of God, must it not? Because that's part of man. See? Part of man, therefore, necessarily is divine. It must, therefore, in its functioning, be rational, reason. Right? Therefore, this activity must be in the soul. That's what he said a moment ago, didn't he? And therefore, we have a very interesting picture, necessarily, that the soul of man is composed of these three parts brought together into a unity. And in that unity, the highest part 
is the idea in the mind of God, or the very idea in the mind of God, or the mind of God, still, still is possible that it, cre it is in all intelligible beings and all intelligible creatures. Therefore, this together is soul. And therefore, necessarily, there is reason within it. Because in that process, now man is going to now turn about and bring about his own unity, his own creation, bringing his own order out of his own disorder. He is then must then reflect back upon what? What is divine in himself. And therefore, he needs an image of the divine in order to meditate. And if you don't have an image of the divine, then you may be doing a lot of things, but you're not in the Platonic game of meditation. This is a Platonic meditation. For the supreme principle of creation is nothing other than man has to work upon himself. Therefore, in our analogy, we can now expand it <coughs> and say, ah, got a new page. God is to his cosmos huh? as uh, <clears throat> uh, the idea is to its creation or the cosmos or see if we can say God is to the cosmos that's a process right? it depends upon it depends upon an idea in the mind of God for that process to take place, one, two, the process itself is a rational process, not cold, right, but filled with beauty and goodness. Therefore, on this side, let me then say, you need an idea, you need an idea, you need an idea, which you then must focus on, and in that moment of focusing on that, you must then create out of the disorder in your own soul, a ordered soul, which will be akin then akin to the same order as the universe. Which we're calling cosmos. Therefore, as God is to the cosmos, so man is to his own work, his own production, which is his soul. Now, beauty and goodness, this is a curious idea. Now, this is an al these are analogies, aren't they? These are four terminologies. But throughout the entire, re uh, through the ent entire time is in Greek cosmology, they play with series of mean analogies, both three and four term mean analogies. Now, let's just take a look at one and make one, all right? Um, as God is to um, the idea of creation, so to the idea of creation. Now, Creation, remember when I talk, uh, it's always not creation out of nothing, it's always a rearrangement. And I don't know a better word for it than a, a, a... Because it's creating, but it's not creating stuff. It's not creating stuff, it's creating beauty, it's creating order. That's out of nothing. That wasn't there. That's the out of nothingness. But it's not out of nothingness in the pure sense because it's out of the idea in the mind of God. So, God is to the idea of creation as the idea of creation in man is to the order in his own soul. So, 
in that sense, while we're studying the time is as Platonists, you want to study the time is because it's giving you an insight into the process of creation which you can turn then upon yourself. That's the all. Therefore, these are the same, though this is greater and this is lesser. Idea, idea. Therefore, it's basically a three-term mean analogy. Right? A is to B is B is to C. And there are two rules in the transformation of an analogy. The analogy is nothing other than two ratios where the connection between them must be similar. Two ratios that have a basic similarity form an analogy. It's that similarity that's the bond. Let's watch that bond, see. Now, within a ratio you can switch the terms and between the ratios you can switch the terms but they must be in the same order. Order, 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 rational. It must, must be the same order. So, therefore B is to A as C is to B. And we can put numbers on this if we like, like two is to four, right, as four is to eight. And if you switch them around, 4 is to 2 is 8 is to 4, same thing. Right. Now, we can now take the second rule and switch the terms in respect to each one. So we can take the first is to the third is the second is to the fourth. Or we can take them in that way. Let's take the first is to the third as the second is to the fourth for our next term. Therefore, B is to C as A is to B. And then we can switch that around using our first rule. Now, what do we get? Look here. Any time you can fold something over on itself and have the same qualities on both sides of the fold, that's the property of symmetry. Therefore, A, 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 right? In the first rank, in the second rank, in the third rank, in the fourth rank. Therefore, you could take, a, take this piece of paper and fold it on that diagonal, and C would land on C, these two Bs would land here, and these two Bs would land there just exactly like they are here. Therefore, if you fold it over, it has a symmetry. But notice C term, the last, which is the last term in the analogy, that too has the same property. You can fold that over. Therefore, this mean analogy has a double symmetry. Well, not only does it have a double symmetry, but the ratio A to B and its converse, B to A, moves from the what's called the antecedent position to the subsequent position. And BC, in a similar way, moves from the subsequent to the antecedent position. Therefore, it has balance. Therefore, that's balance. Like my face has, may have a line of symmetry, so I can fold one side over on the other, but I can't take the bottom half and put it on top or I'd have another mouth up here. Right? So it only has right, a certain kind of symmetry. Right? Lateral symmetry, that's all. <laughs> It'd be funny to see someone with two miles here say, hey, double symmetry. Right? He'd say, congratulations, double symmetry. And he'd probably say, oh, well, that's true, but I, can, I, that, I did that in order to keep from talking on the side of my mouth, and I end up being able to talk, double talk. Right, okay, thank you. I was wondering how I was going to resolve that one. All right, look here. So it has double symmetry, balance, Take a look at B. It's a perfect, beautiful ellipse. Look at this. We can connect them all. A beautiful order. Would you agree with that? Identifiable order. 
when you have identifiable order that you can describe in terms of another figure, then it has a pattern. Right? If there is nothing left out and you're able to then bring together into a unity all of the parts, then we can say this therefore has the possibility of representing anything in a unitary way. That is, nothing is left out, all the pieces then are brought together into a unity. Now, therefore, whenever you're designing a work, piece of literature or your own reflections, if you have three things that can be arranged in terms of a mean analogy, you can see that you can transform them in this way, and if the structure has an aesthetic charm, the very ideas you substitute in the terms must equally carry that same charm because the structure itself has a charm. If the structure has a charm, it has an aesthetic charm. Therefore, the mean analogy, would you not agree, having all of these qualities, these are the formal qualities of anything that is said to be beautiful, therefore necessarily it must be beautiful. And therefore, God is creating according to a mean analogy. Everything he does, if it fits, therefore it must necessarily be beautiful. But wait a minute, this is a high degree of order, is it not? And where we see order combined with aesthetics, we know reason is present and therefore it's a rational beauty. Therefore creation necessarily, if it follows the mean analogies, which it does, therefore it must necessarily be aesthetic and therefore it must exhibit rationality, a core of rationality behind this. Therefore, going back to what we said earlier, remember, what is the supreme originating principle of all? That God wanted to create the universe like himself. Therefore, if this creation exhibits these qualities, therefore in the mind of God, the mind of God must be equally ordered by the structure of analogies. Since the creation he uses has a structure, the structure therefore it's intelligible domain, that do intelligible domain therefore must be in the mind of God, therefore God must necessarily be intelligible, at least to this degree, beyond certainly, but certainly within these, these terms. Now, I'd like to represent this right, in another way, <coughs> to see what's going on. All right, let's see if we can do it again. <clears throat> uh, Um, just symbolically, all right, just symbolically for a moment. Without the terms. There's another very exquisite aspect to this, which I want to bring in now. These are called the extreme terms. These are called the mean terms, middle mean terms. The original statement of the analogy with its extreme terms becomes the middle terms. A is to B is B is to C. B is see, B B see, B is to A as C is to B. Therefore, the mean terms become the extreme terms become the mean terms. The mean terms become the extreme terms in these two transformations. Therefore. It turns on itself, doesn't it? It turns upon itself. The inside becomes outside, the outside becomes inside. It becomes usia-like, doesn't it, right? That's the property of usia. So therefore, the very structure of this kind of analogy upon which creation is based right, is usia-like, and it has that property of turning upon itself. Now, I'd, I'd like to just stay here for a moment then and talk about this because this is the fundamental <coughs> principle of all Platonic theology. This is the fundamental principle of all Platonic theology. And it works itself out in a very fine way. Right? 
That means this is going to be called the highest term. This is going to be called the mean terms. And this is going to become the last term. And remember, we can consider either we can put ideas in there or we can put numbers in there. Uh, and it will, everything will work out in the same way. 2 is to 4 is 4 is to 8. Right. Well, that means the highest term. Let's see how the highest term is functioning. Right? The highest term then moves through all of the places. And therefore, what it does, it brings about a unity and order. Now, sometimes you can see this better if we put in personalities. And let me put in the key personalities in the Platonic corpus of works, all right? Socrates' teacher was Diotima. So Socrates was the student, and Socrates then became the teacher to Agathon. Therefore, we have a basic model of the transmission of a teaching. Socrates' teacher was a woman, Diotima of Mantinea, according to the symposium, and she passed the teaching on to Socrates. Socrates then was able to pass that teaching on to Agathon. If you see that, then, she has a great teaching with great potency and power, and it's able then to extend that sense of unity in her teaching throughout the entire order. Right? It moves through the entire order. So the teaching is a unity. It moves through the entire order and transforms the entire order into a very interesting unity. Now, what does that mean now? Okay. That means at the same time, simultaneously, though, every teacher always has more than they can possibly give the student. The student is able to grasp what the teacher gives, but there's always more in the teacher than there is in any student. The student's challenge is to go beyond what they've been taught and make up that difference as best as they can. Therefore, in this sense, the highest term stands independent of all of the others because of that difference and that difference of profundity. So therefore, let's add to that and say the first term, the highest term, therefore, not only has a unity which moves through the entire order, but correspondingly it remains independent of it and above it, while at the same time extending itself throughout the entire series. Let's take a look at the mean term. All right, the mean term. What is it doing? Well, on the, on the most interesting level, it's standing as the middle, and it's taking something it received, and it's passing it on to something else. Therefore, it stands as a mediator between the two, and it's both a receiver, it receives, and it gives, doesn't it? Necessarily. There it is. It's be between the two. It's between the two. It receives the teaching. Let's put Diotima in here now. D, all right? Socrates, Socrates, Agathon, so I can then address it much more. All right. Which is the same thing as this statement. All right. What does it do? It can reach out to both, right? And it can, it can therefore generate something creatively. It, it, implants, it implants in all, see? Socrates, therefore, is able, therefore, to take what is taught and pass it on to the other. And therefore, he's both receives and he gives. And therefore, he, he makes the unity complete. He makes the complete order because he's passing it on through the entire thing. He's the intermediary, and he's therefore sometimes called right, that which judiciously serves the purpose of preserving the teaching and all its purity and passing it on to the other, and therefore he's a mediator. And therefore that middle position is the mediator. All right? Now, as the mediator then, uh, he brings therefore something interesting. He's able then to link 
he's able to link together. into a unity. So he does the linking. Now, take a look at the last term. The last term is agathon. Now, I want to use one word, likeness, for a moment, okay? What is the principle of likeness, and how does it fit into an analogy? In any analogy, right, A is to B as C is to D, or um, um, a shepherd is to his sheep, right? as a ruler is to his subjects. Right? All likenesses are made by contrasting the first and the third terms and the second and the fourth and using the word like to express the relationship. Therefore, a shepherd is like a ruler, a ruler is like a shepherd. Subjects are like sheep, sheep in some way are like subjects, see, like. Therefore, when God in the time is, uh, is, uh, is reported to, to, to express the thought that the most supreme originating principle of the universe is that he wants to make, bring about a likeness between himself and all that is created, that likeness again presupposes in the very nature and the core of reality the property of analogy. Right? Now, therefore, now, therefore the last term is a key term because Agathon has to become in turn like Socrates. Socrates, in turn, has to become like Diotima. It goes backwards now. Therefore, the last term reverts back to the original position or the original premise or the original uh, uh, knowledge or generating idea in order to bring about that likeness and through that brings about a convergence. All right, brings about a convergence. Why a convergence? Because the last term then, he is, Agathon is going to become like Socrates through this teaching. Right? Therefore, by reverting back to the original principle that started it all, he is now going to be like this figure and through this figure is going to be most distantly like Diotima herself. There are combines in himself both extremes and brings about this unifying aspect all into, uh, uh, not into reality, because this is only a potential. Right? So therefore, he's able to awaken a potentiality in himself. And to the degree that he can awaken that potentiality, he can then bring into being right, the potential that lied dormant within him. Well, if that's the dynamic behind a mean analogy, and if that's the dynamic, then the whole thing and all of its transformations is showing a transformative quality of turning upon itself again and again. Therefore, the very tool of creation being a mean analogy God has chosen the very intellectual model which in itself presents a creative synthesis where all of the potentialities of the last term are then materialized and that potentiality then emerges as it moves across to finally succeeding in bringing the divine into realization which is the goal of creation. Ah. So, <clears throat> um, this, is only, this is only possible in a uh, view of reality where a fundamental goodness is allowed to permeate itself out through all creation. Therefore, this process that I right, notice now, this process that the Creator went through, and which we must go through if we decide to use this as a model for meditation, this very process awakens all of these kinds of activities in respect to our own turning upon ourselves. When, therefore, if it were not for, if it were not for this creation, these qualities would be dormant in the mind of God. 
Therefore, God needs creation to exercise the creative function. Therefore, there always has been a creation. There never will be a time when there wasn't any creation because the overflowing will of God must be creative and being creative, it exercises all of these qualities. Therefore, there must be built into the system the idea that creation is unending, unending, for God's mind must be continuously on itself, continuously on itself, since the cosmos itself is evolving. If it's evolving, then that entire process must be going on simultaneously, and the idea in the mind of God being a simultaneous whole must then break down in the creation, and that's where time comes in, you see? Because when you have an idea that's a simultaneous whole brought into a unity, all together, no differentiation, that's the, that's the meaning of the term eternity. That's what eternity is, a simultaneous whole. Therefore, going from the model to its copy, eternity becomes a copy. The copy of eternity is time, for time is a moving image of eternity. That's what it is. It's a process. The process of eternity, as it proceeds into its creative function and bringing about a copy, transforms itself into time. Three properties of time, past, present, and future, is an unending process and it is nothing other than an unfolding of eternity in sequential developments. Therefore, the idea in the mind of God is a simultaneous whole. It's in a model of eternity. But in the creation process, it emerges into time and through time. And in the whole process of time, God then can reflect. And in that reflection, this is nothing other than a continuous meditation. Therefore, if you have an object of contemplation, right, then you should be able to reason about it. You should then judge. You should then, by necessity, must, it must be beautiful, must have the capability of you reflecting upon it and comparing and judging so that you can bring and fashion out of the disorder of your own soul a high degree of order. And in that order, there's a clarity. And in that clarity, one can then see the nature of the idea of contemplating. What's that idea? Nothing other than? And, what's, and what is sameness? The mind of God. Right. Therefore, necessarily, the contemplation on this model brings you back to contemplating on the divine. Yeah. No, the mind isn't. The creative process is continuously going on. The, the, it is a creative process that's going on. The, the idea in the mind of God is a totality, right? It, it exists complete, simultaneous whole. All of it, it's all there. Would you agree that, they are, that it's possible for some people in principle, whether it's in actuality, I don't know. Is it not possible for someone to know all mathematics? Yeah. Conceive it, the possibility, right? Yeah. And if they know it thoroughly, they don't have to have the book with them, do they? They see through it, don't they? Right. If someone were to say to them, sir, would you mind expressing what it is you know? Would he then have to then drop out of that seeing through it as a whole and naturally, and then create sequentially what it is he knows. Yeah. And that would be manifesting what he knows, but what he knows wouldn't be algebra distinct from geometry and geometry distinct from calculus and number theory and transfinite numbers, would it not? Would it? No. Good. Therefore, in expressing what it is you know on this level, that is a simultaneous whole when you can see it. Or if someone knows many languages simultaneously, you know, that they, they can move from one language to the other freely. They don't need a dictionary to look up words. They see through what they know if it's, if it's contained within themselves perfectly. But if someone were to say, excuse me, sir or madam, would you mind showing us what it is, then the person would have to be drawn to bring it into time, sequentially, build it. And in that process, would they not use all of this? Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. 
Good, that was fun. I was wondering how I was going to do that. Uh, I have a question. How does a demiurgos uh, relate to the one in Platonic form? Well, you see, the, the, um, in this Platonic vision, the cosmos that's generated, since it then is eternal, that is to say it doesn't have a beginning or end, it's not eternity, because the eternity is a simultaneous whole. Therefore, it is something goes on unendingly, has no beginning. Uh, throughout the entire cosmos, there is soul. There's no part in which there isn't. And there's therefore intelligibility present in soul. Therefore, the entire universe is intelligible, has intelligibility has soul throughout, communicates within itself, therefore it's a god. It's, it's, a, it's a god that's generated, so that's one god. Two, the idea in the mind of God, that's a, that theologically is the son of God. The first creation is the idea in the mind of God, that's what it's called, son of God, first creation. That's a god. The god that uses the son of God as a model for creation, right? that's a third. Right? And the fourth is, God independent of that process, so there are four ideas of God, right? Sometimes called Father, uh, Father Maker, Maker, Father Maker, right? Um, so going back, the idea, the idea in the mind of God, that is uh, called in Platonic language, uh, unfortunately, forms, so it's a bad word. It's really idea. It's the idea in the mind of God, a simultaneous all. That's a one-ness. Right? That's a one-ness. Right? Uh, uh, that oneness is the mind of God. Right? But therefore, it's, it represents the intelligibility of God. But it is a oneness, is it not? And we do not agree anything has the property of ness quality, redness, presupposes there must be red independent of the redness that you apply, okay. right? Therefore, if the highest idea, which is in the mind of God, is a oneness, it presupposes the existence of a, One. that's the highest notion of God, theologically. So that's the relationship so that between the, the two. No, no, the demiurgus is, is actively using it. And if you have a pure idea of God, uh, no activity can be assumed because it wouldn't be a one. It would be God and an acting, too. Right. Uh-uh, one. Please. Um, the supreme principle of creation is that God has a desire to create a likeness. Mm -hmm. Where is the authority or logic for that wide would not God want to create an unlikeness? Oh. Something different than Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, anything that creates, any creative process, always, there's always a kinship between uh, the creator and what's created, a similarity. And on the basis of that similarity, there's naturally an outgoing identity <coughs> and love for its object. Uh, Love and identity most freely flow between like things rather than unlike things. The greater degree two things are unlike one another, the more difficult it is to have a communication, a likeness, a love, and a respect for the things. Therefore, the first creation is going to be a step from, see, if the nature of God is one, then the first thing that can be created must be a oneness. For that difference between the two is so slight that therefore, there is so, uh, so much a similarity between the two that there can be a communication and a binding between the two. What naturally follows from oneness is a unity. What follows from a unity is a union. What follows from a union is a wholeness. What follows from a wholeness is a whole. Each one of these is a step further down where an additional degree of difference emerges. Uh, so theologically, the reason why God created something like himself rather than unlike himself that if it were like himself, uh, necessarily, uh, this is where we were going to explore, there it is, providence, right? The idea of providence means that there must be something that is, <clears throat> that 
sees beyond intellect, pro, prior to vidi, uh, uh, mind, that which is prior to mind that brings about a goodness. That's providence. That which is prior to it must be a goodness, and that goodness, therefore, must necessarily be an accompaniment. Let's put it another way. Another definition for God as one is God the good. And there's an essential unity between the idea of the one and the good. If you're familiar with that, I don't mind going over it. But therefore, uh, the good can only, therefore, generate something like themselves because they would then be generating goodness. If they're generating goodness based upon an intelligible model, that's the very idea of providence. Maybe I did that too fast, but that's the way. That's from a Platonic, that's a Platonic answer. See, uh, every good, see, every good, every good, by definition, unifies what shares in it. That's the very nature of it, right? Right? See, if something is good for every good, right? Every good, if there is a good, necessarily then, what shares in it, to the degree that it shares in it, it unifies, it unifies what shares in it. That is, if there's a relationship between the good and the one. If they are identical, just work down on the assumption for a moment they're identical, therefore it would follow, would it not, every good, therefore, must necessarily unify whatever shares in it. And if it shares in it, and therefore is unified, to that degree it is becoming good. To that degree it's unified. And therefore all union must necessarily be good, because it must follow, therefore, if it unifies from the good, therefore all union must be good. And if, if what unifies is good, and all union is good, therefore there's going to be an identity between the idea of the good and the one. Right? Uh, for if indeed, you know, you can go further, you can say, um, uh, if indeed the good brings about the wholeness of all beings, if that's what it does, but what makes good, what makes good, all right, what makes good, uh, pardon me, if the good brings about the wholeness of all beings, but what makes whole, is the one, because from the idea of one, you have one, oneness, unity, wholeness, whole. Therefore, if the good brings about a wholeness, but what, what makes whole is the one, then the good for those it is present to, right, for those it is present to or shares in it, to that very degree, it makes it one, since unifying is a quality of one. Right. I mean, this, this is a Platonic uh, reasoning. I hope I'm not going, I hope we're going together, I presume. Um, it's very beautiful proof. This, this is uh, Proclus, comes out of Proclus's uh, theology, uh, elements of theology. And if you're into it, uh, it's this proposition, 13 elements of theology. That, uh, take the other side, and uh, if the one, if the one on the other part brings together, brings together, right, brings together, um, and holds together the being of each, right? So that's the other side of it. If it brings together, if it brings together <coughs> and holds together the being of each, then to that degree it perfects it. Right? It must perfect it because by holding it together and bringing it together, if this is if, there, if we're going to say there's an identity and that bringing it together and holding it together, it must be a perfection. That perfection must be that it makes it therefore good. Um, which is a very beautiful proof. So now back, all right? 
right? So therefore, if this is, we can go back now to our original assumption. There you can see someone meditating, right? And what would, miss, what would, we, what would we say? To the degree that they have an idea, that idea must be perfect. Right? It must be that which, it must be that to which you wish to be. Right? And therefore, you have to then bring about nothing new. You don't have to bring anything new. Right? Nothing new. It just means you must then discover how to order what's blocking that ideal from emerging. And therefore, you have to then constantly make a judgment between the order you seek and the disorder you experience. Right? And therefore, you have to make a judgment about how to deal with the disorder because you're trying to bring about that likeness. So the process of meditation is not to bring in something, but to discover how to order the disorder. So what you really are doing when you're meditating according to the Platonic ideal is you're really looking at the difficulties you're not trying to imagine yourself into a goodness, but you're trying to bring about out of the disorder and order. You have to see how to order around, find out, hey, why are they discordant? And when you do that, you're judging, you're beautifying, you're making good. Fine. Thank you. I think I've, I've uh, ran out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions? What do you say? All I mean is that I do some meditations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just uh, one question about uh, same and other. Uh, mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. if God is everything, then is not other part mm -hmm. of God? And. Uh, Then is other considered uh, likeness? Well, you, 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 gotta, it's you have a great, you have a great question. You see, because in the time is what few people get to is that issue. So uh, you, you got to have a great one. If I understand your question, let me give it back to you. Make sure. Then where did the disorder come from? Yeah. Right, where did the disorder come from? Would um, it not be used as a tool? to then differentiate the value of the order. Because by having something that's not something yet, then you mm -hmm. have a way to, to experience, to gauge value by comparing it to something that is not of value. Well, you see, you're, of course you're, you're right, uh, because this creative process is, is manifesting a goodness and uh, let me answer it, therefore, in another way. Um, in in Neoplatonic literature, this disorder, there are four fundamental elements, air, air, water, earth, fire. They're principles of that. They're not the things themselves. And, then the, and each one of these elements has a geometrical shape. Each one of them is, has an intrinsic order but they are scattered in a multiplicity. There's no order brought among them, among the way in which they combine. But the elements themselves have a high degree of order. They're all organized in terms of geometric pr uh, principles. So therefore, the question in this, in this literature is, OK, now, what is the very substance of this disorder? And um, uh, you have to read the Timaeus carefully for that. And it's really lovely because in one place, he doesn't tell you what it is, but he'll tell you what it's like. And he says, it's like gold. It's like gold. Shiny, brilliant. It's, it's like gold. <laughs> so you might ask, wait a minute, that's rather strange. Yeah, well, it can be disordered. Gold can be disordered, or something like gold can be disordered, scattered. Right? So what he's doing is bringing it into order. Now, the, why, the reason that's so interesting is that the idea of being 
in the Republic, with a capital B, the very, the very substance of the nature of reality, is when it is experienced, is experienced as the most brilliant light of being, luminosity or luminosity, depending upon which theology you're in. But, um, and that experience of, of uh, divine radiance, therefore, is very akin, therefore, to the very structure of the substance of reality before the ordering. So, the, the, the theological interesting question is, does that mean, therefore, it's all God, and he just brought about himself, he brought about an intrinsic order within his own domain? He wanted to make it much more like the ideal he himself had? <laughs> I'll leave you, that's where I'm at with it. <laughs> Well, you know, on the highest level, that's, that seems to be the question. Because, see, he's going back to the model. He is, in order to create, he has to go back to the idea and use that to bring order. Well, before he did that, if you can talk about it in that language, it could not have been capable of being a model. Well, then... Is this what he's looking at? The mind of God? Is that what's being ordered? <laughs> so with this theological riddle... Um, um, pardon me? He's been the same game of meditation that has... That's right. That would mean that God is meditating. And that's what it's saying. See, that's what they say. That God is meditating on the idea of creation. And our problem is, of course, that we see everything through the senses, and therefore we only see what the senses allow us to see. Perhaps if we could see directly with that intelligible part of our being, maybe we would be in a, seeing the same thing as the nature of God, because one of the parts of man is the mind of God, isn't it? One, two, three. The same, idea of same. That which is eternal always is, no change, which is the mind of God. So is that is that problem of the senses disorder? Pardon? Is that problem you were mentioning with, with when our, our perception, is that disorder? No, the price we pay, the price we pay for experiencing is that we go through the senses. Right. Right. Is that and where we find disorder? Is that experience No, no, the you can find, you can find order. The, the problem the problem is not that we perceive through the senses, but that we make conclusions on the basis of the senses that is inappropriate. So it's the hmm. conception. Like, because I can hit that, I'm going to call it real. Hmm. Though it's already gone, it's past. It endures in the present in some mysterious way. Hmm. Right, but it, some people will say, since I can hit it, it's real. Right, or because I can see it, therefore it must be the way I see it. And all of these other riddles follow from principles of perception. Oh, okay. Oh, right. So that's where we find the disorder? The riddles? No, see, um, what's the difference between, a, a per, if we can imagine someone who's truly enlightened, right? Uh, They'd probably be wearing glasses. <laughs> um, I mean, they're going to they're going to reach for a glass of water. They're going to reach for this. They're going to reach for that. They're going to see things. They're going to drive a car. Mm -hmm. Well, they're still using the senses in the same way you and I are. What's the difference? They're going to eat the same thing. We're going to eat food. They're going to do a whole bunch of things in the same way we are. What's the essential difference? They don't think about it. No, he, well, well, then he's a fool. You mean that he couldn't take a driver's test? I mean, I know from people I know very well that they tell me it's impossible to pass a driver's test unless you have some thinking going on. Right. <laughs> right? So if this is a truly wise person of the highest sense, right, he should be able to pass a driver's test, should he not? Then he's thinking. Therefore, thinking is not the problem for man. Right? Zen Buddhism's idea that uh, thinking is an illness of the mind or a sickness of the mind doesn't apply. It's the beliefs that obscure, it's the conclusions we draw that are erroneous that cause us the problems we have. Got it. Yeah, right, yeah. Thank you. Well, well. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I can. My God, I thought it would be nine o'clock. Missed it by six minutes. That's fun, fun to do. Uh, we should, it would be more, it would be even more interesting than to take it into, um, see this being that he, uh, the being that he constructs, the soul, out of those three elements. He then uh, stretches it out and he makes two strips of it and therefore he joins the two strips and puts one, 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 and one, the other. Um, and then he tilts it to 23 degrees. Um, but in any case, he measures out here um, a, a series of proportions, which is he takes the one part and then doubles it and then doubles that. So you have one, two, four, and eight. Then he takes the other strip and he's going to tie them together later. So he has one, takes three, right? And he takes one, uh, three, uh, nine, and 27, right? And take it as if they were holes and that's where he's going to locate the planets. And the distance between these, between any two numbers, he's going to then structure it in such a way that there will always be two means between the intervals. One will be an arithmetic and the other will be a geometric mean. And therefore, when you then put this together in the cosmos, you have all the positions for the for the uh, heavenly bodies rotating, and that same ratio between the arithmetic and the harmonic mean um, is going to provide you with the same ratio that creates the Greek diatonic musical scale. And that's fun to do. Maybe next time we'll do it. I like that. I like that. <coughs> so, thank you very much for attending. And, uh, fun.